All righty. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining me today. At least it's morning where I'm at. Maybe not where you're at. Maybe you're watching recording. But right now, at least in this moment, we are live in the morning from beautiful Colorado. So again, thank you for joining. Today's webinar is about valves. Open that valve. Let the knowledge flow. You know, sometimes you, you create a title, you think it's clever, and then you go to present and you're like, man, maybe, you know, maybe that wasn't the best title. It kind of makes me cringe, but we'll roll with it. So we're going. Uh, my name is Walt Prentice. I'm a business applications engineer here at Applied Flow Technology. If you don't know us, we create fluid modeling software. So if you imagine you've got flow through pipes, we put that in your computer. Uh, I do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, uh, sales and support stuff. So anyway, thanks for joining. Um, I want to keep things light. That's kind of my style with webinars, but you're going to learn a lot. So in order to uh, ease us into the topic, let's talk about safety here. Soak up the sun. It is beautiful. It is summer out here, at least in the uh, northern hemisphere. And with 2020 happening, everyone's going to want to get out, go explore, do things, but not too much. Don't soak up too much because you're going to get burned. And I could have chosen a worse picture than this. Trust me, Google has a lot of them. So I kept it light. Uh, but too much UV light exposure can lead to skin damage, uh, lead to spots, wrinkled skin, melanoma, things like that. Uh, but even if you don't care about that, what I say is, well, sunburn still hurt. So still be careful, wear sunscreen. Uh, and yeah, so be careful with the summer coming out. All right. So today, the agenda I want to present so you understand what you are going to get with watching this webinar. We're going to do a valve theory overview. So it's probably going to be review for a lot of you, but it doesn't hurt to refresh your memory, especially when talking about softwares, because Software is all about math. Uh, then we'll go through valves and AFT Fathom, which is our incompressible flow software. We have now four main products, Fathom, Aero, Impulse, and Extreme. But I'm going to go first through Fathom, uh, manual valves, control valves, and then other kinds of valves because, uh, well, there's a bunch of them. So I just group them together and the other. Then we're going to go through touch a little bit on Aero and Impulse. Not too heavy, uh, just some extra considerations. So I hope you guys are all ready excited for today's webinar all right let's jump into it why is this relevant to you so i always like to make sure people understand why they should pay attention because i know it's it's pretty easy to kind of watch it and do other things at the same time but it sh should be at least enjoyable for you to watch so the reason is valves are everywhere like a scary movie you just can't get away from them they're going to be in every system your system has that definitely uh, but they play an important role in system losses and control. So it's important to understand how they work and how the software views them. Because knowing how to model them correctly leads to more speed and accuracy in your analyses. And probably most importantly, watching webinars beats working. Am I right? No? All right. Just kidding. Uh, we're going to learn a lot today. But like I said, I like to keep things light. All right. So let's start with that valve theory overview that I talked about. Okay. What is a valve? Now we're kind of getting uh, meta out there. Well, what I say is a valve is a device that makes humans think they have control over their fluid systems. So down here, we've got a picture of a ball valve. Just as an example, you stick that in a pipe and it can, uh, well, like this quarter turn valve, you turn it, it can completely stop flow, or you turn it a little bit, it'll just have a little bit of flow going through, more resistance. But it's useful for directing, or valves are useful for directing flow paths, controlling flow rates, controlling pressures, for safety measures, measures there's a whole bunch of uses for them. Uh, but most importantly, valves are sources of pressure loss. And I bolded that because that's the most important thing when we're talking about software. They are a source of pressure loss. Okay, what kind of valves are out there in the world? Well, there's a lot. There's ball valves, globe valves, check valves, relief valves butterfly valves, and each one of those has all of their own kinds of valves. It's, there's so many wide variety. And so because of that, you know, I'm not an expert on all the valves the world holds, so I'm not gonna go through those individual kinds in too much detail. Rather, the point of the webinar is to understand how the software views valves, how AFT software views them, so you can leverage that in your modeling. So here is an example model with AFT Fathom. We have different kinds of valves here. We've got a manual valve, 
the control valve, and then now starts that other category that I mentioned, check valves, relief valves, and then three-way valves. That's what uh, Fathom holds. Air on impulse doesn't, uh, they don't all have the same type of valves, but this is just an example. Okay, so if you remember the, the most important part about valves is that they're a source of pressure loss. Right? So we're gonna talk about uh, the equations and what these losses really mean. First, we're gonna start off with a CV. That is a flow coefficient in English units, and it has units itself. Usually it's just reported as a number, but it does have units, gallons per minute per pounds per square inch to the 0.5 odd units, but it's because of this equation here on the right. Uh, this is where CV comes from. And uh, through this webinar, when I go through examples, I'm gonna be using CV, not the other metric form, which I'll go through. But this is gonna be the most common spec you'll get from the manufacturer. So if you're picking up a valve, you're often going to hear about CV, right? Uh, and it represents the amount of flow and specific gravity and delta P R1. So uh, I like to think of it rearranged, this equation, in terms of pressure drop. So we just you know, rearrange this so you have a flow over the CV squared. And what I want you to notice about this is pressure is a function of flow squared. That is a common theme throughout fluids. Uh, and it's kind of like a specific heat when you say, well, specific heat is the amount of heat required to raise one gram of a substance one degree, right? So in this case, it's, it's the CV is the amount of flow that causes one pound per square, win, square inch of pressure drop uh, when the specific gravity is one. So it's a useful definition in that way. KV is the metric version. Units of cubic meters per hour, or bar to the 0.5. Same equation, just different units uh, because pressure and flow are going to be different units. Um, like I said, I'm going to be using CV through this presentation. Kind of switch off between metric and English units when I do webinars. Uh, and I, I had this professor that called English units God given units. So I decided to use those today. And then you have a K factor, which is different than CV and KV. It's known as the loss factor. It's more universal for fittings and losses. Uh, CV is typically just you know, for valves. And this is the equation here for K, where again, you have pressure as a function of flow squared. But what you'll see here is this is velocity squared and Q is flow rate. It's a volumetric flow rate and this is a velocity. So still different, but the theme of pressure being a function of flow squared. Uh, and what you'll notice here too is that it's known as a loss factor. So that means when you have a higher K, you have a higher pressure drop. And CV is known as a flow coefficient. It's kind of like they use these terms that match well with what they mean because a higher CV is going to mean lower pressure drop and a higher flow rate. So they're, they're opposite in direction in that way. And the name reflects that. Um, again, just a different way to define the loss. Uh, but it's unique in that it's based on the pipe area, typically the upstream area uh, because of this equation here, velocity. It's not just total flow rate. You know, velocity is flow rate divided by the area. So it depends on the pipe area. So that's just a little bit of theory. I'm sure it, it, it might be um, review for you, but even if it is, it's still go, good to go over. It um, can't go over it enough. And I can also not stress enough that modeling and software is just math. It is math and physics typed out in a computer and meant to help you in your analyses. So the software doesn't actually understand what kind of valve you have or, or what you see in your real system. It's just running math and uh, these valves are a single point of pressure loss. So does it really matter if it's a globe valve, valve or a um, like a, a ball valve? Well, to fathom, no. I mean, it can inform the losses, which I'll explain here. Uh, but according to fathom, you know, it's just doing math. It's just a source of pressure loss. Um, valves can either be defined as a discrete junction on your workspace uh, or as a fitting and loss within a pipe where the loss is spread throughout the pipe rather than it being a discrete point 
and separation pipes. Mostly though, we're gonna go through the junction version because that's what requires the most input. That's what I wanna help you guys with. So again, valves are a single point of pressure drop. There's no length. It doesn't model the internals of the valve. It's just a point of loss. Um, having said that though, the internal parts of this valve, the real valve you have, does inform the loss you can expect and that you can plug into Fathom to uh, get the appropriate loss. But at the end of the day, it's just about pressure drop. Okay, so now let's go through the valves in Fathom. Again, AFT Fathom is our incompressible flow software, steady state. So uh, this being kind of like the base program that everything else revolves around, it was our first software we launched or Trey launched way back in the day. Uh, so what you see in Fathom is mostly similar to all AFT software, but not exactly. Uh, but the point is, if you can understand Fathom valves, it's going to translate well into other products. Three types, the manual valves, control valves, the other kinds of valves that are not as common or uh, not as applicable in steady state. But I will touch on them briefly because they are a part of the software. <clears throat> so the first one is going to be the manual valves. This is just the term I'm using. It is a valve that has a specified loss that's not going to change. It just is that loss. You as a user put that in. So here we've got a screenshot of a the valve window, the properties window where you as a user input data. So um, I'm sure you've seen this if you've used the software at all. But what you'll notice here is that it's asking you to put in this loss information. So the user specifies the loss either by using the handbook data, which is just an internal database we've taken from literature in the world uh, about you know, how to get a K factor if you uh, don't have that info from the manufacturer, or you use raw input, the user specified stuff, which includes CV, KV, and K factor that I touched on a little bit earlier. Now a resistance curve is a little different, but it stems from this idea that pressure drop is a function of flow squared. So if you have one data point of what kind of pressure drop you see at what flow rate, well, you can generate a resistance curve. You just need one point because everything else is known about the system. You know, there's no pressure drop at no flow. Then you have your point that you've defined and you create a second order curve fit because pressure drop function of flow squared. Okay. So the, that's what the user does. The software then gives you output info on the valve, like pressure drop, flow, uh, equivalent orifice area, or the other loss definitions, which what I mean here is, you know, if you specify a K factor, well then the software will tell you what, was, what would be the same CV that would cause this, uh, kind of back calculates this stuff. So let's have a look, shall we? Here is AFT Fathom. I've created a model here, pretty simple, just to show the effects of valves, where we have uh, 100 pounds coming in. Again, I'm using English units, so if you're a metric, uh, what is this, maybe seven, eight, I don't know, seven bar, something like that. Coming into the system, going across a valve, where we'll see some pressure drop, and I've specified this to be 100 gallons per minute, so what you'll see here is 100 and 100. If you remember that equation, I should expect to see one pound of pressure drop. Uh, but the difference between these two lines is that I have three inches and I have a six inch line. And everything else though is the same. I have the same definition of CV, same uh, driving force going across that valve, same flow rate. The only difference is line size. We're gonna see the effects there. So this is what a manual valve looks like. Fathom, if we open the properties window, we can see that screenshot I took and showed you before where I just want to focus on the loss model tab right now because uh, I know there's kind of a lot going on. It can be overwhelming if you're not too familiar with it, but we have a data source, right? Remember, you can do the handbook from literature if you don't know what else to use or use a specified if you've got this info. So handbook data, Again, it's just a list of different things that the literature has as like a baseline estimation of what the loss would be. So we have a ball valve, right? 50 degrees open. The, and you want to use, if you're going to use this, you just want to use this uh, definitions table to help you along where 
these are the sources that the loss info came from. So we don't provide the textbooks for you. We just sell the software. So if you really, really want to know what's going on, where these guys get the info from, you've got to get their textbooks. Um, but most people will use the user specified option. I originally had it as CB and it was at 100. So let me put that back. Uh, and that's about it. You know, we can choose KB, K, or that resistance curve that I mentioned. Uh, again, flow or pressure drop being a function of flow squared. Great. Same uh, definition on the other valve. Let's go ahead and run the model. Control R. I love keyboard shortcuts. I don't like to click too much. So that's a little tip for you. All right. I'm going to zoom in quite a bit. So here's our output table. So again, we just did input. The software gives us output. So if you go look at this valve summary, which uh, is specific about these valves. And so you don't have to look at everything else here. I'm just going to collapse these so it's not overwhelming. Too much data. <clears throat> here we can see the same flow rate, same CV, but very different K factors. And this is a product of that, uh, if you remember that slide where I talked about CV and K, well, K is all about velocity. Even though they're the same flow rate, well, they're, one's a smaller pipe, so they're going to have different K factors, even though the CV is the same. And what you'll see here, even though the, they were the same pressure, uh, this is static pressure, and I defined the boundary condition as stagnation pressure, if you're wondering. It's always a good question. But you'll see the software gives you meaningful output, like, okay, the total DP, which is what I predicted, right? If we have a CV of 100 and a flow rate of 100, well, I'm going to get a pressure drop of one uh, pounds, of course, per square inch. And we get a little more information over here is something useful uh, for like sizing, especially with control valves, which we will get into. But it would get, it gives you, well, if instead it was an orifice, what would be my diameter here? What would be the, what diameter of the orifice would give me the same loss? And this really shows uh, that Fathom doesn't necessarily actually care what, what kind of valve or junction you have, what it cares about is the loss information, right? It, it, if I put an orifice in place of this valve with the same uh, definition here that it's given me, I would get the exact same results. I'd get the same pressure drop. Uh, it would give me the same equivalent CV, give me some Ks, right? Because it's just software. It doesn't have its own brain to you know, really understand what your system is doing. That's why it's called a model. Okay, so what I wanna do here is take it a little deeper. I'm going to create a percent open table. So here on the right, we have the scenario manager. I can create children's scenarios where it's an exact replica, useful for doing lots of, you know, what if scenarios or change this, change that, if you've never used it before. So I'm gonna open the valve. Again, we have a fixed CV. Something that's really cool within Fathom and all the software is we can go to this optional tab and we can create an open percent versus CV table. What this means is uh, as the valve is opened or closed, it has a different CV. It's got a profile to it. And different valve types have different profiles like that. So what I want to do is create a CV versus open. And I want this one. I'm going to go down. There are different options, but I like predefined. It's just leveraging AFT's database. Full open CV. I'm just going to say a full open CV of 200. Right now, I had it defined as 100. Right? I'm going to do butterfly valve. And it's going to create this graph for me. So you can see, so you would expect maybe in your head, well, if I'm at 100, a CV of 100, and my max is 200, shouldn't I be at 50% open? No, because it's not linear. That's the point of these valve characteristics and uh, defining it based on the valve type. Not every valve is the same. So we can transfer that. And what this does, uh, I can still specify CV. What it will do is tell me what my percent open is. So in this one, I'm going to do the same. Remember, optional, create CV versus open. I want to predefine this one, same CV like we're doing before. But this time, I'm going to use a globe valve. I'm going to show the graph. It's a little different. The butterfly valve was a little more dramatic at the end. Okay, cool. Keeping it 100. We run it. Output. Valve summary, 
nice and zoomed in. So here we have the exact same results as the previous scenario, right? We have the uh, same pressure drop, flow rate, CV. Well, it's because I'm defining CV, of course, but same case. What you'll see here oops, is that it's now reported a percent open. And even though everything about this system is effectively the same except for the line size, uh, even if they were the same pipe size here, the percent open would still be different because it's based on CV. So it's the same CV, but because they're different types of valves, they're at a different percent open. So you can also then take this back, and if I were to go in this valve and say, well, 75% open, then it will tell me the CV, which would be should be about 100, right? Yeah, 99. Good. Okay, so that's a quick overview of manual valves. You're going to see these a lot in your models. Uh, you should use them a lot, at least. The next topic is going to be about control valves. Uh, the reason I took these two valves out, out of the other category is because I view these as opposites. The manual valve has certain input and output, and the control valve has kind of the flip side of the input and output. So here we have a screenshot. I will go through this a little bit uh, more, but the point is you as a user are specifying one of these things. So the best way to put it is the user specifies desired outcome. So you want a specific uh, pressure or a specific flow. You tell it that, right? So again, like pressures, or should drop or flow. Uh, these are the different definitions. So you can do uh, control the downstream, upstream pressures, flow rate, or the total pressure drop. Uh, you just put it here in this blue box. And the software then reports the loss that gets you your desired outcome. So remember that previous slide, manual valves, you specify the loss, the software tells you the results. And this with control valves, you tell it the results or the thing you want, and then the software will figure out what loss is needed. So it'll tell you what a CB is, what KB or K factor is. So this means it's useful for sizing purposes. So even though you might not have a control valve in your system, you're, you're designing for something, you wanna know, well, what size orifice should I get? But you can use a control valve to specify the parameter you want, like a flow rate or a pressure drop, and then it will spit out these, this information like um, equivalent orifice area um, or CV if you're trying to uh, size a regular valve, right? So let's bring it up in Fathom. Control valves. Okie dokie. So very similar system to before. The difference here is that I've made these uh, static pressures instead of stagnation. Um, and uh, I've changed this outer boundary condition from a flow rate to a pressure boundary, and that's because I have a flow control valve in here. But similar system, different line sizes, but really what's important are these two different definitions. So here, if we open up the properties window, you'll see my screenshot again, right? Where I just wanna focus on the top half of this window. So again, I know it can be overwhelming to see a lot of things, but you have the valve type. What kind do you want? Do you want to reduce the pressure to something, which is a downstream control, sustain it, which is an upstream control, um, control the flow rate, which is what I have, or the pressure drop, right? So as you do this, it's going to change the different things about it because it's a different type of valve. So right now I, I had it at 150, I might have to save this just uh, in case I mess something up, but uh, I'm specifying a flow rate and it will then tell me everything else. Again, don't worry about this yet. I have went through and I did fill in an open percent table before, and this is a globe valve. So you can do the same thing as you, you would with a manual valve, and it's going to, again, tell you how open it is. So if we go through uh, and look at the second one, I've just done a pressure sustaining. It's just a different definition of what you want to see or what you want output on, right? So we run the model again, control R, that keyboard shortcut, mm -hmm. love it. Okay, so let's take a look here. We have junction 18, my flow control valve, right? So it tells me the pressure drop across it. My flow rate is 150, surprise, because I told it to be that, but you'll see it yields then a CV, 
it yields a CV, KVK, um, the open percent because I had defined it before, so I'm about 50% open, uh, and then it gives me some orifice areas. So you can see how this is useful for sizing as well as like actually controlling your system. Because if you're just sizing, you can say, well, if I just stick an orifice in there with that area or diameter, then I'm going to get the same results because maybe you're sizing for an orifice. Um, down here, we have controlled the upstream pressure. I believe it was a PSV. Yep. So I met my set point, right? And then it tells me everything else that would need to be there uh, in order to get the same results, right? A CV or a KV. This is very big, uh, but that's because my pressure drop is not that big. And I have very a very wide pipe. It's six inches compared to the three inches. So my CV is massive. Uh, very low K. Again, remember the equal or the opposite directions of CV: high CV, high flow, high K, low flow, or high pressure drop. Um, let's take a look here. Go into our graphs. So what you'll see, uh, you can use uh, the graphing outputs. I guess uh, the visual part of the tabular data to see these pressure drops. And you'll see they are very different pressure drops between the two lines because, well, one has a, uh, well, there are different types of valves. One's a, a flow control and one's a, a PSV. But you'll see, you can see uh, at a quick glance, the magnitude of pressure drop. And if you were to compare that to like the manual valves that we saw before, what you'll see here is that, well, those had the same pressure drop because they had the same CV even though their behavior is very different. So total flow rate, the same. And again, the static, so that's why they're not exactly the same up here versus stagnation, it would be. But they end at very different pressures. The pressure drop is the same, but different system behavior. So again, going back to the control valve, here it's very similar system behavior with a much larger though pressure drop across the valve. So it's uh, not moving as fast, right? This um, shallower sloped profile here. Okay. Now there were some parts on that that I didn't show you or that I didn't go through. And I want to talk about that now. Control failures. So what happens if you can't meet the set point though? You say I want 150 or you say actually I want 350 gallons per minute. I'm going to change the name. I always forget to do that. So, I'm, you know, it keeps things sane. Down here in this second half is going to be all about, you know, failure. What if the set point isn't achievable? Always control such that no matter what, it's going to meet this flow rate, even if it's unrealistic. So we're going to go with that right now. What does that mean? How does it, how is it going to meet this um, set point? So it tells you first it's a critical warning. It's not realistic, cool. But it's because it adds pressure. So here, it uh, a DP typically is uh, reported as a positive number because it's assumed to be a loss. So if it's negative, it means it gained pressure. It had to add pressure like a pump to get that flow rate. That is one style of failure you can do in Fathom. And that's just, uh, it's nice to flag you that, hey, something's really wrong. If you don't want to do that, you can do uncheck that and what it's going to do is it's just going to open fully as big as it can and it's not going to meet the set point but it's going to be as open as it can and that's because the more open the valve is the more flow can go through so it just couldn't control flow rate it didn't add pressure but it's also zero well that's not always realistic you even at a hundred percent open you might have some loss right and that's exactly what our open percent table would tell us even at 100% open, we have a little bit of loss. And that's what this over here is about. Loss when fully open. I want to CB. I want to use my open percent table because I've already got that defined. What that means is when it fails and it wants to be 100% open, it's going to take the CB from that table and use that. So this is going to be the most realistic outcome. But the thing is, um, it's going to, it's still going to flag you. But it's going to, uh, if you're not watching for that, you could just assume everything's fine, right? Because you got it, oh, cool, I got a pressure drop here, got a flow rate. What you need to really pay attention to is valve state and this, and it's failed open. Okay, well, maybe there's a problem there. Maybe my valve is too small. Um, so if it's 100% open and it's still not able to control, well, there's a problem. 
right? So those are the different types of control failures you'll have. Okay, I know it's kind of quick, but you can come back and watch the recording or ask me for my slides. I know it uh, can be quite a lot to take in because now we're gonna go on to other types of valves to fathom. There's a check valve, which prevents reverse flow, uh, usually like in front of a pump or something. So the thing about fathom though, it's steady state. It only shows it either as completely open or closed. Like it doesn't model the transient part of it opening and closing or slamming. It's just, it is open or it is closed. Relief valves, pretty similar. Uh, it uh, allows venting to prevent overpressurization, uh, but it's similar to the check valve in that it's either open or closed. Now, relief valves are a little different. You can have a profile where, um, here you, you'll notice I use the word completely open or closed, and this one I didn't. It's because um, if there's a certain pressure differential across that relief valve, it can have a different CV than you know if it was a higher pressure differential. So it can be a profile in that way, but it's still steady state. So there's one solution. It can be either closed or it's popped open, like there's one answer. And that's, if they're just kind of weird junctions to think about in steady state, definitely useful. It can tell you things about your system. They're just weird to think about. That's the best way I can describe it because you have to understand it's steady state. Um, again, more of a transient type of valve. Then there's the three-way valve which is a valve that directs flow with three connecting pipes. Um, pretty self-explanatory, I guess, in that way. But you need to define loss for the split flows. Three-way valves, at least from what I've seen, mostly are like just to redirect flow, you know, going from one pipe into another. Usually it's not about splitting flows, but you definitely can do that. But the unique thing about the three-way valve is that uh, when you're taking away loss from one pipe, you're adding it to another because it's like one mechanical system. So uh, yeah, increasing the loss in one flow path will decrease it in the other. Of course, it depends on uh, pipe sizes and the geometry of the valve. But that's the general rule that we'll see. So I can't go through too much of these. Um, again, they're not as common or useful in steady state, so I kind of want to go fairly quickly. But here we've got a relief valve. So if this pressure gets is too high, it's going to open. The, even the way I'm saying it is inherently transient, right? If this pressure goes above a point, it's going to open. Well, it's steady state, it either is above the pressure or it's not. Um, the check valve here, very similar, where either my, uh, my velocity is high enough to keep it open or it's not. It won't you know, uh, model the opening and closing. And then a three-way valve, not transient, but just a different type of valve to direct flow. So let's look through that check valve that I mentioned before. Very similar to a manual valve in that you specify a loss factor. So here I've chosen a K factor. And down here is probably the, you know, this is, well, the most unique part about a check valve is you can tell it when it should close or at what velocity it should close. Usually it's zero to prevent reverse flow. But in this case, just to show you what it does, I made it eight. So what this means, is if my velocity is less than eight feet per second, this guy is gonna close. Now, with steady state, this is how that works. You run the model. You'll notice this line in the solver. I know, I mean, does anyone really read this solution progress window? I do, because I work here, but you really should if you don't. Um, I know you probably don't want to, but you'll see here, rerunning solver because one of our special junctions state changed. What happens is it runs the steady state figures out, hey, my velocity is actually less than what my check valve needs it to be to be open, so I'm going to rerun. So it reruns with the check valve closed. So you'll see uh, this caution, check valve is closed. We go to the valve summary. Let's look at that check valve. Oh, it's just failed closed. It's just gone. So there's no flow going through there. Again, that's some of the, the way it handles it in steady state. Very similar to relief valves. And that's I, relief valves are a little more complicated, so I can't go through too much. Uh, even in the transient side, I wish, but just for the sake of time, I can't. But you have different definitions, you know, if it's internal and exit or inline exit. It's going to take a little bit, but just kind of use your imagination and the help file to really understand what these mean. But I have an exit because it's just going to vent to, well, I have it set to, to the atmosphere. Um, and it's just going to open 
the way I have it, it's gonna open instantly and close instantly. Kind of tricky wording again, because it's steady state, it just is open. But this is what I meant before, where you can have a pressure profile, where if it's like, you know, only a certain DP across this valve, then it will have a different CV, but it's still a single steady state solution. Uh, I'm gonna go to instant back here. And you can have constant back pressure or not. All this means is either you specify an absolute pressure where if my pressure here is gonna be 75, it'll open, or a DP, a uh, pressure differential. And I've chosen constant back pressure. So if this is at all 75, it's gonna open. And just let's do some engineering real quick. If my set pressure is 75, but right next to it, well, pretty close, assuming this is a short pipe, I have 80 pounds. Hmm. Well, I'm going to guess this is probably going to be open. In fact, that's why I put it in the webinar. This flow is going to now go through that way. As soon as it opens, and it's going to be venting to atmosphere. We should actually expect reverse flow. But this blowdown pressure is the pressure it's, that's required to, uh, to close the relief valve again, to reseat. Uh, probably just more useful in you know, things like impulse where you're doing transient analysis. Because if you do it in Fathom, it can actually get stuck in a loop because it's open. Well, then it's going to close if your you know, exit pressure is too much, things like that. So uh, really what we care about is the set pressure, the slow down pressure. I mean, it's not going to cycle through because it's a steady state answer. Just That's the way the relief valve is set up, though. And then over here, we've got the loss model. So one tab over, we say, OK, well, now I'm, I'm telling you what the loss will be if it's open. If it's not open, then it doesn't matter. But uh, as we predicted, it is going to open. So CV of 100, cool, let's run it. Now, what are we looking for again? Ah, this rerunning solver because one or more special junction states change. Reading the progress window, helpful. Cool. Okay, go to the valve, relief valve. Hey, it's cracked open. It's popped. Cool. So if it was on a profile, it might have a different CV, but I've just defined it as like instant opening, a single CV. So that's what it does. Um, kind of an inherently transient type of valve, but it does exist, so I'll go through it. The three-way valve, I do not have a separate scenario for because I'm just gonna go through it quickly. It's, you have a you know, combined flow, they have split flow path, and then you're, you're def you are defining as a user what percent open means and what the CV is. And what I've done here is just had them in reverse, where, let's see, we had 100% open, no flows going through one of the pipes and you can you know you're gonna have to match the pipes what what is pipe number one you tell it that um, go through but this is uh, what i was talking about where you're taking loss from one flow and adding it to another so when you define the percent open it it's it gives a re uh, respective cvs for each flow path the cool thing about that is when you go to the valve summary again here you, you will see output on the different pipes and the losses for each path and the flow rates for each path. I, it's always kind of weird to think about a single valve, but with you know three connecting pipes or two outlet pipes, but Fathom handle it, handles it pretty well. Yes, I think that's it. All right, cool, that's Fathom. So let's talk about Aero. Aero is our compressible flow software. So squishy uh, equations of state, things like that. Definitely harder than math. So some extra info is needed uh, for compressible flow, right? Because there's changing density and possible choking when you have compressible flow. You might not be an Aero user, so uh, maybe you don't know as much about compressible flow, but the point is it's harder, so you're gonna need more input. There's this term XT, it is the terminal pressure drop ratio needed if defining CV. Man, I have answered many questions about, well, what is XT? I don't have that, I don't have that from the manufacturer. Yes, not, you don't always have that number, but the thing is, it's from a standard. It's from this ANSI standard, you can see it there. Um, and it, it just is required for the math. So we try our best to help our users figure out an XT if you don't know one, such as like, with a guide uh, or just telling you to do a sensitivity analysis. But the example I'll show is really gonna reveal what the big deal about XT is. Uh, pressure drop ratio, I mean, I'm, I'm going through this real quick. So you, you're probably like, well, what the heck is the terminal pressure drop ratio? 
it's a pressure drop ratio that uh, if you drop the pressure anymore, it's going to be choked. It's like your this is this is it. It is your limit. But the important thing is blog alert. One of our very own AFT members, Mr. Scott Lang, wrote an incredible blog. I'm trying to pull it up here. There's the link. Here is what it looks like in real life when you click the link. Um, he talks about what XT is, and you'll see, oh, yeah, it looks like real mathy, you know, for people with big brains and all that. But there's not too many words. He actually does a really good job of explaining it, and it helped me understand. I go to this. I have to reread it because compressible flow is just, you know, pretty tricky, but it's a great resource to help you understand what XT really means, right? So that's the point of the webinar, not to tell you everything, but to give you the resources so you know what to do. Okay, uh, or, so that's if you're doing a CV or KV, you just need a K factor. But the thing is, a K factor is really defined for incompressible flow, like if you find K factors in literature. Uh, and there's really no universally accepted corrections. So when you use a K factor, it just is the K factor. There's nothing like XT with it. But it's it's useful if you just need baseline losses, um, not as exact, but and doesn't account for choking, but can still be useful as you know, first round approximation. So let's look at arrow. Similar setup setup to what I had in Fathom, where I've got uh, three lines here, all the same pressure, boundary conditions all the same line sizes now. I think they're all two inch or something. Yes, two inch. Um, same CV, same flow coefficient, different XTs. So that's what's varying across these. So if I open the manual valve in arrow, we're going to uh, see a very similar type of window to what we did in Fathom. The difference is we're going to see XT, FL, and FD. Well, these are optional. I'm not going to go through them, but XT is required because it's part of the calculations. The best way I can I can describe XT for the layman and for myself included is that when you have a really, really low XT, that means pretty much any drop in pressure is going to cause choking. So if you have a tiny, tiny XT, like even if you drop, you know, maybe 0.1 pounds, you're gonna be choked, very sensitive in that way. And if you have a very high XT, it can only go as high as one, kind of like Mach number in that way. Um, pretty much, it's never gonna choke because you can have an, you know, at like no pressure on the other side of the valve and it's still not gonna choke because I'm at an XT of one. So anyway, just keep in mind, a really low XT means more likely to choke. A high XT is uh, not likely to choke not as likely and it's also involved in calculation so it actually it's not just about choking it still affects the loss but we'll see how sensitive it, it is so i have i've pretty much put on like through the whole rainbow right 0.1 all the way to one let's see how that affects our system behavior about summary let's boost this up collapse the pipes in conjunction with it because we don't need it oh well not very exciting because it doesn't really affect it. <laughs> so when you're looking at this, don't be overwhelmed by, oh, I don't know what my XT is. Do a sensitivity analysis, man, because it really might not be that big of a deal at all. About 0.1 is the lowest you'll see. Uh, so we have very similar uh, pressures, very similar flow rates. And honestly, since you're modeling and it's uh, there are assumptions made here anyway, it's like you're not ever going to get an exact answer so just do a sensitivity analysis to see how big a deal it is what i want to do here is do i'm going to do i'm going to cause choking so if i have an xt of 0 0.01 again remember if i'm really really low i'm going to change the name again because i always forget i'm glad i remembered okay when it's really low it's really likely to choke, and that choking then is gonna cause very different pressure loss behavior. So that's when it really does matter. So here you'll see, oh, well now we got a new choking tab because it exists at, at junction one because I've squeezed it so much, it's such a tortuous path through that valve that it's just, it's getting choked. So what that means is any pressure, if I drop the pressure anymore, 
down here, it's not going to cause any more flow rate because it's at its max flow rate. But you'll see here now the pressure responses are quite different, right? You have a much larger pressure drop, flow rate's a little lower, um, K factor is different. Hey, CV is the same because I specified it that way. But uh, <clears throat> that's why it's good to do a sensitivity analysis. But I I have gone to the extreme of doing 0.01. So don't do that as part of your uh, sensitivity analysis. I just did it to cause choking. But what you'll see here, if you go to this guide for what XT should be for the different types of valves, I mean, look at these numbers, 0.7. The lowest is 0.2, right? And that's what the literature has found. This is um, from ANSI. I believe it's directly from ANSI, uh, if not just literature related to it. So you're never going to get to 0.01. So don't worry like, oh, man, I might, yeah, I might have to go that low. I'm just, I was just showing you that choking will happen. Use this table to get a good range and just test your system because it might not be, you know, that big of a deal. It just is required as part of the math and as part of the standard. Okay. Now let's go through impulse. Impulse is our, well, it's incompressible flow when in steady states for liquids, but it's, uh, I guess, still kind of like compressible because you have wave propagation and there's still a little bit of squishiness to the fluid, but it's, it's a liquid, you know, water hammer software where we're modeling fast transients. That word transient is important where we're modeling things with time. Arrow, and fathom were steady state. And I know I didn't go through all the valves in arrow. They're pretty much the same as what's in uh, fathom, just you need this XT. Well, impulse is kind of you know on a different plane because you have now transient data to consider. So it's similar to what's in fathom, but has some extra transient info and it doesn't have as many types of valves as to simplify the transient analysis. So when I went through and talked about these valve characteristics in Fathom with the percent open table and how different valves uh, have this, um, well, different characteristics where a 50% 50, 50 open can mean a very different CV for different types of valves, even though they have the same uh, range over here. It really matters when you're doing transient analysis because we're talking about valve closures over time, and that's very different for different types of valves. Right, so if you have a very steep one, you can imagine the water hammer effects are going to be very different, pressure effects different. Um, but here, so when I open it up, you'll see a similar thing to what we had in Fathom. But here we now we've got transient data where kind of like the open percent table, now instead of percent, my variable is time. Uh, I'm going to well show how the CV changes over time, similar to open percent. So anyway, let's let's get in there. Again, gonna be pretty quick. What I wanna show here is you always, always start, if you're an impulse user, start with the steady state, calibrate that, make sure things are okay, looking good, then do a transient. So now I'm on the transient. That's what that T means is I've got a transient on my valve. So wait here before we get to it. I've got three types of valves, globe, ball, and what we call quick opening, which is just kind of like the opposite of the ball valve uh, profile-wise. But uh, same boundary conditions, same pipe sizes, same closure time. So what you'll see is everything will close in two seconds. This is all we're doing. We're closing a valve in two seconds, just with different types of valves. So um, we look at the open percent table. Again, from Fathom, you remember we can create that. Let's show the graph. Cool. Okay, that's my globe valve shape. Now, if we show this graph, it's the same but opposite because we're closing it and because we're assuming you know linear closure with time as far as open percent goes, you can just replace this time with open percent and it would be the same style of graph. Um, you create this graph by editing table and create from uh, open percent. And then you know since you've already got your open percent table, you just tell it how long is the transient. Okay, two seconds. I want, you can get as uh, refined as you want, like 0 0.1 or 0 0.2. Uh, I did point to, I need to find its closing, and then you create the graph. Oh, well, bada bing, bada boom, transfer it. I've already done that, so I'm not going to uh, go through it. But we did the same thing with ball valves. So different profile for closing, and then quick open. You'll see, actually, um, it's going to, it doesn't drop real quick. It drops slow and then real quick, and that affects the system differently. <clears throat> so again, closing about two seconds. 
let's look at the response. I know transients, if you're not if you're not a user of impulse, it might seem overwhelming. So I'm not expecting you to like remember all this. I want to show you though that it's important to consider these effects with valves, and then we can learn how to do that through different resources, or you know, we can help you out. So these are the three different pressure responses from my three different um, uh, well examples, I guess we'll call them, where I have. This one was my globe valve. This one's my ball valve. This one is my quick opening. Well, my maximum pressures are very different, even though it's the same closure time, same CV. So isn't that pretty amazing that such a, such a similar system can have a different response because of the type of valve you're closing? Uh, this one's a little more dramatic because I only have one valve in the system. You know, if it was a giant system where I had 200 and I only closed one valve. Well, it's not going to be as controlling, but anyway, it's just to, to show you what's going on. Over here, we'll see the volumetric flow rate changing. Um, the yellow one actually causes reverse flow, which is pretty interesting, and the other ones don't. We're actually going to get negative pressures with this yellow one. So what we're looking at is time on the x-axis, volumetric flow on the bottom graph, and pressure on the top. This is right on the upstream side of the closed valve. So it's like where that water hammer hits, and we see that whoosh. So not only does it go higher, it's also delayed, it's a little different. And that's because remember that nature of that valve is changing uh, different than the others. And that's what this one, probably the most useful graph to show. So these are the, the uh, characteristic curves that we showed, right? Valve CV over time. The globe valve kind of does that squiggle, the ball valve steep at the beginning, flat at the end, and then the quick opening is kind of the opposite, where it's flat at the beginning, steep at the end. Well, let's notice where, where does the flow rate start to change in each one of these? It changes around 100 CV, right? So if I'm on the red one, I'm at 100, go down to this, that's where the flow starts to change, right? At 100 CV, that's my controlling CV. The thing is, it gets to, each valve gets to that point differently and at a different time. So this quick opening valve, even though it's closing over two seconds, really its effective closure is like less than half a second. So that's why it has such a more dramatic pressure response because even though it's closing technically over two seconds, the effective closure time is only a little bit. It's only you know, 0.5. So it slams, causes these high pressures, while the other ones don't. They're a little more smooth. They don't cause as much. And the effect of that can be these high pressures, but then low pressures. Low pressures are always the other half of high pressures. So we actually get liquid column separation, cavitation in our system, uh, and you can use mo uh, impulse to model that. It does model the cavitation arising from that. Uh, I know that was quick, and I wish I could go th through more with impulse with like relief valves and check valves because those are inherently transient, but I just, I can't uh, for the sake of time. So that was quick. I hope you can rewatch this and, and get a better grasp of what I'm talking about with the transient part here. But the, really, uh, what I want to do is, is give you some resources to help you because I know it was quick. So we have a great tips and tricks blog. Everything I say about AFT is going to be great. So <laughs> you'll, not, you'll see that the great tips and tricks blog. So if you go to our website, you'll see tips and tricks. Um, the thing about these are, if you're confused, likely someone else has been confused, talked to AFT about it, and AFT says, hey, it's probably a good idea to write a blog on this to stop confusing people. That's where this XT blog came from, right? And we got webinars, webinars for days. Uh, we got upcoming ones and previously done webinars, so that's gonna be down here in the Learning Center. Uh, these are especially great for transient modeling that I barely touched on at the very end of this because it's such a multi-dimensional topic that we have tons of webinars on that. So let me pull this over, boom. Uh, again, in the Learning Center, you can go to webinars, our webinar library, where we have impulse is gonna be that transient one, where we have tons of resources on impulse. Introductions, cavitation, pulsation, um, talking about component issues, valve characteristics, right? So it's good stuff. And then the help file and walkthrough examples. I think, you know, when I first started using the software, man, I don't, I don't really like using help files to be honest. 
But when I started using it, I realized it's actually pretty helpful. You can search stuff in there. So you'll find it in the software, go to help file, search around all of these topics, all the math is gonna be documented there. It really is nice to, to search through. And then of course we got waterhammer.com. This again, gonna be for the transient side of analyses, but they are excellent resources. Again, that adjective of how great AFT is. <laughs> excellent resources put together by staff at AFT and Purple Mountain Technology Group kind of collaborating together. Any topic you wanna to understand when it comes to transients is there. Like valve characteristics, yes, like we talked about today. I know if this is like the first time you heard about it, it's just, it's a lot to drink it, you know? So if you go to the website, you'll see there are articles and you'll see things about like valve closures and, and uh, valve characteristics. Great articles, I must say. So anyway, thank you. I'm glad we made it on time. Uh, hope I didn't drain your energy too much. I do really appreciate it. Uh, if you have any questions, please email me. My contact info is right there or call us. Uh, happy to help. And I guess have a great rest of the day if it's day where you're at. If not, well, then good night. All right, thank you guys.